What's cracking, yo? Welcome back to Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. As promised, I said once I hit 1,000 subscribers, I would release my top 10 players of all time. And while I thought I didn't need to think about it much, as I started putting together these rankings, I found it to be extremely difficult and found myself moving players up and down. I tried my best to be completely unbiased as much as I possibly could and really try to weigh things from as many angles as I probably or as I possibly could. I started finding myself in debates with players where I would say, well, I think this guy was clearly the better basketball player. But this guy was a still a great player, not as good as this guy. But when you look at what, we, what he was able to accomplish in his career, this guy had a better career with better accolades. And I didn't want this to turn into a better player versus who had the better career because I almost felt like I would be copping out of the greatest top 10 players of all time. So I had to try to find as much of a balance between purely what you are individually and the team's success. I always thought the I always thought the debate for the greatest of all time or even ranking 10 of the greatest players of all time is always a very nuanced process. I don't think the answer is ever black and white. I just want to say that players have to get ranked, right? So while there may be a player that's high on the list, and there may be a player that's low on the list, it does not mean that there is a whole bunch of separation between player A and player B. The majority of the players on my top 10 list each have an argument to be the greatest of all time and to occupy that number one space. It really comes down to the details when parsing these players against each other. So as you can see, I'm not doing one video where I just go through all 10 players. I'm going to release a video for each player with their ranking and a explanation as to why I ranked this player where I did. And there's going to be a playlist specifically for that. And you can find the link to that playlist in the description of each of these videos. With that being said, let's get into the player for today. All right, just to recap where we are in our top 10 player, or rather my top 10 players of all time. Number 10, Shaquille O'Neal. Number nine, Tim Duncan. Number eight, Wilt Chamberlain. Number seven, Bill Russell. Number six, Magic Johnson. And now rolling into our top five, where I stress again is extremely difficult. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, AKA the captain, landing in at number five. Just a quick rundown on his long list of accolades and achievements. And bear in mind, I'm only going to be covering his NBA career. I know Kareem is generally considered the greatest basketball player of all time or the greatest basketball career of all time when you consider what he was able to do at the collegiate level as well. Um, but this is just pro NBA career that I'm talking about right now. So Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was seven foot about two inches, about 225 pounds, slender, slender physique, extremely skilled. Uh, was drafted in 1969, first round with the first overall pick, and was selected by the Milwaukee Bucks. He had a lengthy 20-year career from 1969 to 1989, playing only with the Milwaukee Bucks and with the Los Angeles Lakers. He also had a coaching career from the late 90s into about 2011 with a few teams, but never a head coach, just one of the assistant coaches. All right, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of his accolades. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a six-time NBA champion, one time with the Milwaukee Bucks, and five times with the Los Angeles Lakers. Two times NBA Finals MVP, six-time NBA Most Valuable Player, 19-time NBA All-Star. Keep that in the back of your head. He only did not make the All-Star team once in his career. 
incredible. 10-time All-NBA first team, 5-time All-NBA second team, 5-time All-NBA defense, defensive first team. I always say that. I always say that wrong. 5-time NBA All-Defensive first team. The bit about came to talk. 5-time NBA All-Defensive first team. Shit. 6-time NBA All-Defensive second team. NBA Rookie of the Year. All uh, rookie first team, two time NBA scoring champion, uh, won the rebounding uh, or NBA rebounding leader one year, four time NBA blocks leader. All right, to name a few, to name a few. At the time of Kareem Abdul Jabbar's retirement, these are some of the records he held. At the time of his retirement, most seasons played, most games played. Most minutes played, most blocked shots, most defensive rebounds in a career, most defensive rebounds in a game, most defensive rebounds in a season, most playoff game appearances, most All-NBA team selections, most All-Defensive team selections, second most defensive win shares, most offensive win shares, most win shares, most playoff minutes played. Credibility to his skill, his effort, as well as his longevity, you end up with things like this. Having longevity is incredible, and not everybody's blessed with it, especially being able to play at a high level this long into a career. We all know Kareem held the record for most career total points up until LeBron James recently surpassed him. But on his career, Kareem Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has 38,387 points, for an average of 24.6 points per game, over 17,400 rebounds for an average of 11 rebounds per game, a little over 11, and over 5,600 assists for an average of 3.6 assists per game for a center. Offensively, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was an absolute monster. Nobody can guard this guy. And we all know one of the reasons why he had the most unstoppable shot in the game, patented, never duplicated, never recreated, the skyhook. All right. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was extremely effective in the low post. You can say dominant in the low post. Like I said, he had a slender physique. He wasn't a big, hulking guy like Shaquille O'Neal or really, or had the strength of a Wilt Chamberlain. But he just had immense skill, immense footwork, an amazing soft touch around the basket, even away from the basket, where he could use his length and those really long arms to get close to the rim, even with notable separation between his body and the basket. Now, in his earlier years, I've read that he, he he maintained that more slender physique. But as he got older, he put on about 30 pounds, bulked up a little bit so that he could be more effective guarding under the basket. Like I said earlier, the sky hook was impossible to stop when you consider Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's height seven foot two and his wingspan good lord good lord how could you stop this man the the sky hook first of all you have to deal with the separation of where the ball is and where the defender is. And you got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's body separating the defense from even getting close to where that ball is. So you're already dealing with the horizontal plane separation. Now you gotta deal with the vertical separation on top of that horizontal plane separation of this guy's extremely long arms. And still coming out like this, still a couple feet from his body that's already separating itself from the defender 
and then trying to even catch this thing as he sky hooks it. You could not block. It was unblockable. Not It was unblockable for the face-up defenders. The only way you could possibly block it is to sneak up behind the man. And then, and then that would be extremely hard to do without fouling at the same time. The other thing that made this sky hook so effective, and I've seen him do this plenty of times in video footage, is when he would come in from outside the box and make a step or dribble into his sky hook and lean into it. After the ball releases... He still pushes his body forward toward the rim, arms extended, so if the sky hook did not go in, he was already there to tip his own rebound in. <laughs> Another thing about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's sky hook is that he could do it just as effectively with the left hand as he could do it with the right hand. That created much more havoc on the defenses, the ability to switch hands on either side of the basket or any placement on the court, really. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was an outstanding rebounder coming into the league and all the way through the prime of his career. His rebounds per game didn't really start dipping until he just started going on the downside of his prime, but he was still a top player in the league still dominant and still very effective but he was just coming around that corner on his prime but listen to these rebounding numbers as i go down year by year 14 and a half 16 16 and a half 16.1 14.5 14 16.9 13.3 12.9 12.8 10.8 10.3 and then after that he started dipping down into the single numbers 8.7 7 and a half 7 7.9 7 so on and so forth as he started winding down his career. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was a dominant force on the defensive end. And I'll tell you this right now. I really struggled between Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on who I wanted five and who I wanted six. It, it took me so many days before I, before I had to f come to a conclusion on where I wanted to place Magic and Kareem, but ultimately what slid Kareem into the fifth spot was his long tenured commitment and dominance on the defensive end where Magic did not have that. And that was that was the um the, the deciding factor for me when trying to figure out Magic and Kareem. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, as mentioned earlier, was selected to a total, total between All-NBA defensive first and second team 11 times, 11 times. He made life extremely difficult for the offense because he was blocking everything at the rim. And if he wasn't blocking everything at the rim, he sure as hell was making it hard and disrupting shots and forcing players to alter their shots midair. On his career, on his career, he averaged 2.6 block shots a game. It's incredible. Incredible. He was quick. He was agile. His length gave him the opportunity to zone at times, like kind of like an individual zone. He could float a little bit. And, and, and um, you know, if offense are doing a lot of pick and rolls and things like that, and they're kind of caught in between switching and not switching, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's length gave him the ability to cover as much space as needed until the defense could commit to each individual player. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar took amazing care of his body, had a great diet, which allowed him to play as long as he did also there's a there's a lot of luck involved with that he was able to stay away from any season ending or career ending injuries that some players just unfortunately incur but Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was able to, to avoid that you know you can take as great care of your body as you can but sometimes freak accidents just happen and you can't do anything about it regardless of how well you take care of your body. I am a big Bruce Lee fan. 
And I've always thought it was cool that in Bruce Lee's film, Game of Death, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was in it as an antagonist. But besides that, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bruce Lee had a great friendship. And Bruce Lee trained Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said this about Bruce Lee. The discipline and spirituality of martial arts, which was greatly responsible for me being able to play competitively in the NBA for 20 years with very few injuries. Close quote. Shout out to my boy Bruce Lee. In my opinion, the greatest fighter of all time. If anybody knows about taking care of their body, it's Bruce Lee. It's Bruce Lee. So if Bruce Lee takes you under his wing, you know you're going to be in tip-top shape to compete. And with that being said, through each of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's Seasons he played, he played the vast majority of games. A lot of 80 plus seasons, a lot of 70 plus seasons. And he never played less than 62 games in a season. Never. Was able to stay really healthy. And in fact, I know two of the injuries he had, they were self inflicted. I think he punched a player, I think, and punched a backboard and, and broke bones in his hands and fingers or, or something along those lines. But those, those, those might have been his two most significant injuries were self-inflicted. Don't quote me on that. I'm just trying to go off of memory, but I think. Now, coming into his rookie season with the Milwaukee Bucks, then at the time, Kareem's name was Luau Cinder, before he changed his name for the nation. But he came in busting people's ass, 28 points per game, 14 rebounds per game, in his rookie season. In his rookie season. Did not win a championship, but the following year, which would be the 1970-71 season, the Milwaukee Bucks acquired all-star guard Oscar Robertson, and we all know who that is. Oscar Robertson is a guy that some people will put in their top 10, rightfully so. Together, Kareem led them to 66 victories, and then a record 20 straight wins in a single season. Alcindor, a.k.a. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar of the future, um, in the future, got his first MVP award that season, along with his first scoring title. On top of that, he led the league in total points, and the Bucks went on to win an NBA championship, sweeping the then Baltimore Bullets 4-0 in the 1970-1971 NBA Finals. Kareem, I mean Alcindor, excuse me. Alcindor dominated that that series, especially game four, dropping 27 points, 12 rebounds, and seven assists on their head, and was named finals MVP, averaging 27 points per game for the series on a blistering over 60% field goal percentage. Kareem, for his entire career, shot a very high for, uh, field goal percentage. You can credit a lot of that to his, his skill set and his sky hook. After that, Second year with the Bucks and winning a championship, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would go on to play four more seasons with the Milwaukee Bucks. Though he never won another championship with them, he did become the first player to be named uh, MV NBA MVP twice in his first three years. All right, And he also won his third MVP award in four years. Incredible achievement. Following his sixth year with the Milwaukee Bucks, we all know what happened next. In 1975, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was traded to the Los Angeles Lakers, where he would continue to dominate like he did most of his career. He came into L.A. averaging almost 28 points per game, damn near 17 rebounds per game, over four block shots a game. Absolutely incredible. However, the Los Angeles Lakers would fail to make the, pl the playoffs and finish under 500 with a 40-42 and 42 record. From 1975 up until 1979, it wasn't too good for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the Lakers. They really didn't have much success winning, and most of the seasons ended in a bit of a dud. But we all know what happened in 1979. That boy Magic, Irvin Johnson, was drafted to the Los Angeles Lakers. And in his rookie season, he would help lead the Los Angeles Lakers to an NBA championship alongside Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now, we all know the story of that finals, right? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar gets hurt, guts it out in Game 5. 
doesn't play game six. Magic plays at center, has an amazing game, 40 plus points, 15 plus rebounds, seven or eight assists, something like that. And clinch that victory for the Los Angeles Lakers to win the championship. And with that performance, he was awarded finals MVP. But many would argue, and they have an argument for this, that even though Kareem didn't play that game six and Magic Johnson led them home in his absence, that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar still should have won that MVP and was more impressive in the series as a whole. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in those first five games of that series was averaging 33 points, 14 rebounds, had blocked a total of 23 shots. All right. And like I said, he sprained his ankle in game five, hobbled into the locker room, I believe, or on the bench into the tunnel, something like that. Came back out, gutted it out to secure the victory for the Lakers and finished on, on a bum ankle. 40 points, 15 rebounds with a game clunch, clinching dunks, not clinching, a game clinching dunk with under 30 seconds left on the shot clock or, or at 30, something like that. But it was like a go-ahead dunk to seal the game. Kareem had put that team in position to win and even get to a game six, all right? But people said the media was biased with the MVP voting and they wanted to give it to Magic. Kareem was already constantly scrutinized for shunning the media and wasn't media friendly in a way that Magic Johnson was. Magic was the complete polar opposite and everybody loved Magic. And then when you look at the story behind it, how he didn't play and Magic got put in that center along with his personality and everybody loved him. They felt like they robbed Kareem. People felt like they robbed Kareem and gave it to Magic when he probably shouldn't have got it. I would say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar suffers from the Tim Duncan syndrome, or rather, Tim Duncan suffers from the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar syndrome. In some ways, I just made this term up. <laughs> the syndrome, I just made that up. And the fact that these guys aren't very flashy. They don't give the media a whole lot. They don't say a whole lot. Often quiet. And so, they're really not going to get the love and adoration from the general public and from the media that other players would get that are a bit more polarizing in their aspects of their game and their personality. Now, at times, Kareem was polarizing. Well, you can say Kareem did have a polarizing personality, not so much because he's very timid, right, but because of his, his off-the-court opinions and beliefs. And for that reason... He was polarizing. Kareem was still the best player on that team, even though Magic was winning more awards at the time. But Matt, but Kareem was still the anchor of that team and was doing a lot for them offensively and defensively, leading while Magic Johnson was orchestrating like the maestro that he is and running the show and still being great, don't get me wrong. Probably sometime in the mid-80s is when Magic Johnson definitively took control of the team and was the alpha guy, the undisputed alpha. And there wasn't no power struggle like we see a lot of times. It was a peaceful handing or peaceful passing of the torch from Kareem over to Magic. And Kareem, in his later years, were still dominant. Even as he was sloping off, getting past his prime, he was still a threat on the offensive and defensive end, though his rebounding dipped a bit, but he was still giving you high efficiency, high accuracy on the points, still getting those block shots, and even throwing in some steals, and being a protector, not, not just of the space, but of the area around the rim, or not just of the rim, not just a protector of the rim, but that general space around the rim, he had that area covered. It wasn't until Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's 18th season where he averaged under 20 points per game. And just barely, he was at 19 points per game. 18. It took him 18 seasons before he dipped under 20 points per game. Incredible. And he was still giving you 19, damn near two blocks and damn near seven rebounds. Season. Year 18. Year 18. Anyway. I could go on forever talking about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 
his longevity, his dominance, what he meant to the game, his accolades, the champion that he is. You can, you can even talk about his college career and so on and so forth. You can go on forever, but based on everything I just said are the reasons why I got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the fifth greatest player of all time. And that defense cannot go unnoticed. Mm -mm, not at all. A completely unstoppable force that played an extremely long career is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You guys let me know. I know I didn't touch down on everything. I probably missed a lot of key points about Kareem. But you guys, especially you guys that lived in that era, can tell a better story than I can. So if you have anything to add to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's legacy, please let me know in the comment section. Please add, please add more context to what I'm saying so that we can continue to shed true light on a player that was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I appreciate each and every one of you. Let me know where you have Kareem ranked on your all-time list. And take care and be blessed. And I'll catch you on the next one. We out, baby.